would still love you. But why? Because you're smart and cruel, but not really. Maddie Perez is the queen bee of Euphoria High, but unlike the cruel Heathers and Regina Georges we're used to, she has a heart. Like the stereotypical mean girl ringleader, she's popular, has lots of confidence, and, well, some anger issues. Sorry to hear you, bitch. What? But when a Regina George type is sabotaged, we cheer along, while audiences want to see Maddie succeed. The difference is, Maddie's a really good friend. Rather than a cruel despot, and her anger tends to be justified, not indiscriminate. She also has bigger actual problems than, say, a few unwanted pounds of weight gain. Maddie is the character you get if you take the alpha mean girl seriously and look into what made her and what it's like to be her. So what makes Maddie such a special version of the high school queen bee? That is the ugliest effing skirt I've ever seen. Queen bees on screen are often cruel. Mean Girls' Regina George rules over her cohort with an iron fist. Heather's ringleader, Heather Chandler, plays sadistic games of croquet. Maddie can be harsh and violent, but there's justice to her anger. Kat, what the f is your problem? You're being a bad friend. When she attacks someone, it's typically because they actually did something wrong, not just because she wants someone to pick on. Racist. So while other queen bees are respected outwardly but secretly hated, Maddie is truly respected. I wish you could see yourself the way the rest of the world does. Queen bees always have a tight posse, but most seem to choose their friends based on superficial qualities, making it more about how useful her followers are to reinforce her power and popularity. Maddie is friends with a more varied group. Regina's plastics practically wear a uniform. On Wednesdays, we wear pink. While when Cassie dresses like Maddie, Maddie's weirded out. Wait, why are uh, you... my classes why then? Another common popular kid trope is that they have a friend in middle school who they ditch for not growing up to be cool enough. We were best friends in middle school. I know, right? It's so embarrassing. But Maddie is still best friends with her childhood friend Kat, who wouldn't fit, for example, Regina George's harsh body standards. She's not too image obsessed to be publicly friendly with Cassie's shy little sister Lexi and her friend Rue. And Maddie isn't just nicer than other queen bees, she's a genuinely good friend, empathetic, fiercely loyal, and loving. Bitch, you're my soulmate. She listens and pays attention to her friends' inner lives. What's wrong? I, like, can't stand Ethan. I was wondering. That's why, while it's a win for Regina George's followers to turn on her, it's heartbreaking when Maddie's bestie Cassie betrays her by sleeping with Maddie's ex, Nate. I would have never done this to you. Queen bees almost never get vulnerable. They tend to hide their weakness to maintain their image of a strong leader. Psychologists know that anger is often a way to hide other emotions like sadness. With the more comedic queen bees, their anger is left mostly unexplained and therefore unjustified. But with Maddie, we get to actually see the vulnerability behind the fierce exterior. She talks to her friends about what hurts her, especially about Nate, even if she still makes sure to sound calm and matter of fact. I think Nate really f***ed me up. And the show also lets us see Maddie in very private, scary moments when she is terrified and hurt by Nate. You're f***ing dead to me. Queen bees tend to come from privilege. They're mostly very wealthy and very white, reflecting how real-world popularity often is tied to material advantages. But Maddie is Latina and seems to come from a middle-class background. Her mother was an esthetician which is a fancy way of saying she gave pedicures to rich people. Even as a little girl, Maddie notices class differences and becomes determined to change her position in the hierarchy. She quickly realized that there are two kinds of people in the world. The people who sit in the chairs with their feet in the footbath, and the people who kneel in front of the footbath. So while other it girls are, at least partially, born into their status, Maddie makes herself into a person others admire. Part of the difference between Maddie and the typical queen bee stems from Euphoria not being a comedy. So that means Maddie's not written as a cartoonish villain or a one-note joke. The show also has a more ensemble focus, so Maddie gets depth instead of being just a one-dimensional supporting character. But more fundamentally, Maddie moves the queen bee character in a new direction because she's framed as both a popular girl and and, gasp, a good person. This is hard and confusing. The last thing you need is to feel worse because you're not feeling something you're supposed to feel. 
do what feels good to you. And if you think about it, the classic portrayal of queen bees as automatically mean and shallow shows condescension towards teen audiences. It implies that, A, if girls strive for power and popularity, they must be jerks, and B, that teens are so naive and stupid that they blindly idolize rich, thin, white girls even when they're terrible people. So by rewriting the queen bee as aspirational and human, Euphoria shows a respect for teens that is rare in older media. The core of the queen bee is confidence, and no one gets this better than Maddie. You didn't have to be the prettiest or the tallest or the blondest or the whitest. You just had to have confidence. Maddie was always self-possessed, but we learned she added to that innate quality by building up her outward confidence like a kind of armor, realizing that the secret is simply appearing confident. 90% of life is confidence. The thing about confidence is no one knows if it's real or not. So what makes this portrait of a queen bee different is that Maddie's highly aware of the constructed nature of confidence. She essentially invented herself as a queen bee by making a conscious choice to develop confidence. And she's even secure enough to generously share that insight with others. Everyone feels stupid, who cares? You feel stupid? Yeah, I did. And then I just chose not to feel stupid. Because Maddie understands that looking confident has the same effect as being confident, she makes sure that every inch of her outward persona radiates teen girl power. She moves in a self-possessed way and almost never looks flustered. I had never seen anyone as sure of themselves as her. When she talks, she often sounds a little bored, a classic cool kid move. Do I know you? She uses fashion as a weapon. Her fits can be aggressively revealing, but they seem as though they're less about looking sexy than simply flaunting the confidence it takes to pull off that kind of outfit. Maddie's makeup and hair are another part of her arsenal. Her edges are always perfectly laid down, and her makeup is heavy and super bold. Euphoria's makeup artist Donnie Davey said a Maddie wing is always the sharpest wing, sharp like a knife to cut through whatever stands in her way. Since Maddie's confidence is built from the outside in, it makes sense that she would put a lot of stock in appearances. She studies the mannerisms of the rich women she sees at the nail salon, she imitates porn to keep Nate happy, and she tries on the outfits of Samantha, the well-off woman she babysits for, literally putting herself in Samantha's shoes. Maddie's role model is a character in a movie. Sharon Stone in Casino was like Maddie's spirit animal. Like Sharon Stone's Ginger, Maddie appears both very noticeable and sort of enigmatic at the same time because of the total control she exercises over her image. But if someone crosses either of them, they're in big trouble. They each have a scene where they burst out violently in a very public setting, attacking a person who angered them. Cheers. Maddie, get out of here. Get lost? Yes. We'll have a but mainly, Maddie admires and copies Ginger's approach to men. The cool thing about Sharon Stone in Casino is that she ran the over De Niro, and she did the same to Nate. Maddie's focus on appearances leads to her biggest strength, her confidence. But her interactions with her toxic on-again, off-again boyfriend, Nate, examine how, especially with young people, too much focus on appearances can also make them vulnerable to danger and even mask ongoing abuse. It's like the root of a lot of violence. Maddie initially gets interested in Nate because he looks like what she wants. He's the star quarterback and behaves like a real gentleman. At first he was a gentleman, like flowers every day kind of gentleman. Nate cares about appearances too, hiding the parts of himself that don't fit what he thinks he must be. Between the two, the entire relationship looks aspirational but feels contractual. She looks and acts like a girlfriend should, and he gives the gifts a boyfriend must give. Both Maddie and Nate are acting out what they think love is supposed to look like. And since they're the star couple of Euphoria High, they also reinforce that this is what it's supposed to look like to everyone else. Jake and Marta's relationship was our first impression of love. But in private, their relationship is physically and emotionally violent. The writing underlines how men like Nate who performatively act the most chivalrous can also be the most misogynistic, controlling, and volatile. If anyone ever try to hurt you, I kill them. You're like the sweetest guy ever. Maddie tells Nate she's a virgin because she knows it's what he wants to hear. And she's so aware of Nate's obsession with her purity that she lies about whether her interaction with Tyler was consensual, leading to an innocent guy getting badly beaten up and terrorized. Seeing hyper-confident Maddie terrified and broken by Nate takes all this Queen Bee High School dynamics to a different, more serious place. And the portrayal reminds us how poorly we understand, as a society, what a victim is. It wasn't the violence that scared her. It was the fact that she knew no matter what he did, she'd still love him. 
Maddie is the last person you'd call weak or naive or who would seem susceptible to someone like Nate's manipulation. But abuse victims can find it incredibly hard to leave for a number of reasons. For example, because their self-esteem and identity have been greatly damaged. You know when somebody just constantly criticizes like everything about you? While Euphoria makes sure to clarify that the mistreatment Maddie suffers is in no way her fault, she, like many young people, falls for the fallacy that play acting the picture of real love is enough to create real love. At that age, we all thought we knew what love looked like. Eventually, the truth of their relationship rises to the surface where everyone can see it. When a police officer tells Maddie, Trust me when I tell you that the person that did this doesn't love you. The line cuts through the perfect veneer Maddie is holding onto, and in season two, Nate's public betrayal with Cassie is the final nail in the coffin ruining the illusion of the outwardly perfect love story Nate and Maddie both cared about projecting. So where will this queen bee go in the long term? Audiences tend to expect the typical on-screen cool kid narrative, peaking in high school and eventually becoming an unsuccessful and immature adult. But Euphoria makes everything grittier, so the washed-up path Maddie could go down feels way scarier. The second season raises the prospect of her getting forever stuck with Nate, and it draws a parallel between Maddie and Nate's mom, Marsha, who married the wrong guy, Nate's dad, Cal, when she got unexpectedly pregnant. Are you sure the test is accurate? Like Nate and Maddie, Marsha and Cal clearly also care about appearances. They enjoy a comfortable lifestyle and upstanding reputation in the town, while Cal lives a secret double life and Marsha knows about it to some degree. You know how many men I've What? Cal, stop it. But the show gives us hope for Maddie not going down Marsha's path. Season two introduces her elegant and wise new mentor, Samantha, who helps Maddie gain a new level of maturity and insight into her drama with Nate and Cassie. If you were still dating guys like this in your 40s, we'd be having a very different conversation, but you're 18 years old, who gives a shit? It's symbolic that Samantha gives her vintage dress to Maddie, as though she's inviting Maddie to follow her life trajectory, growing from an impulsive mess into someone who's happy and together. Because I was messy. <laughs> oh, and I love to fight. And Maddie both literally and figuratively dodges a bullet when Nate acknowledges that their relationship is now truly over. I humiliated you. It's over. When Maddie tells Cassie that she's now at the start of the vicious cycle, Nate broke up with me before I even went on that stage. Don't worry. This is just the beginning. We get the sense that this queen bee is ready to move on to a new, hopefully healthier chapter. I just feel bad. Bad enough to stay in East Highland for the rest of your life? No. This video was written by friend of the take Anya Formozova. If you liked the ideas here, you can check out her channel Q22 for more interesting cultural insights. Click the link in the description below. Thank you.